All right, well, welcome everybody, both uh, in person and across the internet. Uh, this is the American Academy of Actuaries Pension Forum on Modernizing the U.S. Retirement System. Uh, my name is Josh Shapiro. I'm the current Vice President for Pensions at the American Academy of Actuaries. For those of you who are not familiar with the Academy, we are a professional association of 19,000 members with uh, dual missions. One is to put forward professionalism standards for the actuarial profession. The other is to sort of serve as the voice of the actuarial profession on matters of public policy. We provide you know, objective, uh, objective advice, unbiased advice uh, to policymakers on uh, matters of public policy that have an actuarial component. Uh, it is that second mission that, that brings us here today. Uh, the, the background of this forum is the, uh, the Academy does an annual meeting every year for our members where we have a variety of sessions on public policy with uh, esteemed panels, not unlike the one that we have here. Uh, it's been a very large success for a number of years. And after the most recent one, as we were kind of debriefing it, we, you know, two questions came up. One is, wouldn't it be nice to do these things, but more broadly, where the audience is not just actuaries and Academy members, but, you know, everybody. And the other question was, it's so wonderful, why do we do it just once a year? Why don't we try to do these a bit more often? So this, uh, this forum here is very much a response to those questions. Uh, we're looking to, to draw attention today to matters that relate to retirement income. Uh, a couple of quick uh, housekeeping notes. We uh, have this being live streamed across the internet, and as you all know, the internet never forgets. And we also have media in attendance. So we're gonna do our best, be on our best behavior and keep it clean. Uh, as you probably would imagine, the, uh, the opinions that are gonna be expressed by our panelists are theirs and theirs alone, not necessarily the opinions of the Academy or their respective organizations. Uh, we have time set aside on our agenda for questions and answers. We are gonna do our best to get all of those, both in person here in the room and also questions that might be submitted across the live stream. Uh, but we do have a full agenda and a lot of people, so we apologize in advance if we're not able to get to all of those questions. And, uh, and with that, uh, it's time to get started. I'm going to hand it over to Ted Goldman, our senior pension fellow, who's going to kick us off. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Josh. Where's the clicker? Yeah, here it is. Welcome, everybody, and thanks for, for coming today. Uh, we think we put together a nice uh, program and uh, just wanted to set up a little bit more before we get started. Um, the, the first is, you know, our goal here today is to really advance retirement policy um, and focus on emerging ideas that have potential to align public policy with the, the changing world. And the, the key word here is ideas. Uh, we're going we're gonna to just throw a lot of new thinking out here. Some of it's not so new, some of it's brand new, some of it's at different stages, but our, our goal is to really stimulate some thinking and uh, continue this dialogue even after the program. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end too. So two quick setup slides. Uh, one, as we thought about you know, what, why we're having this and what we want to accomplish, something really, really hit me very hard anyway, uh, and that is there's been a lot of change uh, in, in our society, in our world over the last few decades and started thinking about all these things and got a little bit overwhelmed. You know, and here's a, a long list of those. I'm not going to go into each of these in great detail, but you have an aging society, and Steve Goss is going to show you in a minute the, the uh, increase of the, the dependency ratio of how the population is aging. We're living longer, which uh, it makes it harder to save for retirement. All these things make retirement more interesting or more difficult or more challenging. Uh, the longer life expectancies a volatile economy with low interest rates and ups and downs. How do you plan? How are you supposed to plan and, and mitigate those risks? Uh, the employer-employee relationship is really evolving in an interesting way through the Uber and gig, uh, non-standard workforce economy, whatever word you'd like to use for that, and just the relationship between the employer and the employee, which has been a key central part of retirement uh, for a lot of people. Uh, the inequality, the change, uh, the growing gap of inequality in wealth, in income, and education, too. There's a strong correlation between education and preparedness for retirement. And, and then finally, one maybe not so evident is the family structure is fewer children, has implications for how the family structure uh, take, is, uh, is involved in retirement years, and uh, more, more divorces, certainly two, two income spouses, 
uh, families. Uh, so a lot of changes in the family structure that when you think about it have broad implications for retirement. So when you add all these up, a lot has changed. I mean, we have not, uh, we've not stayed still. And then you start thinking about public policy and how has policy kept up with these really significant changes in how we're going to uh, have to deal with retirement. And I think there has been a, a real lag uh, and a slowness. There's been some, some uh, positive events, but a real lag in keeping up with all these important changes. And these changes didn't happen overnight. It wasn't a, flip, a switch that got flipped on, but they've been evolving. But it's time for us to, to, to uh, try to move policy ahead to catch up with some of these important changes. So what are some of the key objectives that we might uh, focus on? One is what we're going to talk about is, as Steve's going to talk about, is Social Security needs to be reformed to keep up with the changes on, on the left-hand side of the page and also become financially stable. Uh, we need to expand retirement plan coverage and participation. It's one thing to cover people, but if they don't participate, we, we've fallen short. Uh, the employer role, I, I, at least I think, is an it can be a very trusted part of this process, and, and we need to find ways to strengthen that relationship and give, empower the employer to provide education, resources, tools, uh, support for the employees to get to retirement, even in reflecting the changing dynamics of that, that relationship through, through the non-standard workforce. Um, and, and then facilitating individual uh, decision-making is another key. And my next slide is gonna set that up nicely. And then all these lead to what we want to get is increased benefit adequacy so people can, can maintain standard of living in retirement. So we have a lot of work to do. And uh, you know, I just started thinking about all the things on the left, and we could have a whole session on any one of those items, but together they're pretty overwhelming. So on, on the decision-making side, uh, this, I'm going to steal a quote from Richard Thaler, who a recent Nobel Prize-winning uh, behavioral economist. And, Behavioral uh, issues, I think, are becoming more and more an important piece of the retirement solution, retirement puzzle. So, and he said, asking people to, to figure out their own retirement, to plan for their own retirement, would be equivalent to asking people to build their own cars. So on the left-hand side, you've got all the car parts. Imagine you walk out in the morning and all your car parts are strewn across your front lawn. If you're like me, you, you would just not know what to do and uh, break out in this cold sweat and be sitting there putting wrong pieces together. Even if they were nicely laid out like this, I think I'd probably put the seats in the wrong direction. Uh, and then compare that on the right, where we're asking people to make a, a number of really sophisticated decisions about, uh, about retirement planning. And I put people in a couple of categories. You have people that no matter how much education and hand-holding we're going to give them on this topic, they're going to break out in a cold sweat and they're going to just, you know, say, this is not what I want to do. And then uh, you've got people who, who, who are capable of doing it, but they rarely take the time to do that. And then you've got a small group that's capable and does it, and some of them do that well. So if you look about it, there's a big need across our society. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lori, who's our, uh, our uh, Lori Lucas is the CEO and president of Employee Benefit Research Institute, and she is our moderator for today's program. Lori? Thank you very much. Um, I am really honored to be here. This is quite an um, August panel of experts on the topic of retirement security. Uh, so my role is to uh, walk you through the agenda for today, which is a little unusual, uh, and then also uh, to uh, handle the Q&A, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, but we, uh, in terms of our agenda, we uh, have uh, with us Starting off, Steve Goss, who is the Chief Actuary of the, Society, uh, of the Social Security Administration, and he will discuss the role of Social Security, obviously one of the very uh, key components of retirement for uh, many Americans. We'll then uh, uh, turn to Mark Ivory, who is the non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, a visiting scholar at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, and many of you will know him as the former senior advisor to the Secretary of the Treasury. Delighted to have Mark here talking about the policy um, from past uh, to future. He's obviously done a lot of work in this area, which he'll share with us and give in perspectives about going forward. We'll then hear from Ted Goldman, Senior Pension Fellow at the American Academy of Actuaries, who will talk specifically about preparing for retirement. And at that point, we will have a pause for Q&A. We'll have a group discussion. Before we move on to Steve Vernon, who is a research scholar at the Stanford Center on Longevity, and he will talk about living in retirement. 
I will then uh, wrap up with moving forward and we'll have another group discussion. So um, please hold your questions until the group discussion, unless, of course, you are on the internet. Uh, you can then submit your questions along the way and we will, uh, we will answer them during the group discussion. So it will be formal Q&A. And uh, if you're in the room, wait for the microphone to come to you because we do want to record this uh, for our live streaming. And uh, give your name and affiliation, please, as well. Um, so uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Steve. Well, thank you very much, Rory, and thanks, Josh and Ted, for the invite to come and uh, join this to give a little kickoff on Social Security, which, by the way, I love the slide about the car parts. They made it a little bit easier by putting your calipers and rotors, like, right together in each case, so it's, it's, a, it, 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 it's not as hard as it looks, actually. We should, we should have a quiz here. Who can name every part that was on there? Okay. <laughs> So I was asked to talk to you a little bit about one of the three legs of the retirement stool, Social Security, which is actually the new guy on the block, because personal saving, you know, uh, employer-provided pensions, those have been around for a while, and Social Security, you know, the first annuity payment started in 1940, so a relatively new guy. Of course, some other countries got a head start on us. Okay, for Social Security, what does it provide? I think everybody in the room, uh, some are probably already personally aware, uh, that uh, monthly retirement survivor income payments have been payable uh, to folks starting in 1940. Uh, disability payments didn't start until 1957, not exactly our topic of the day. Uh, one of the interesting things about Social Security is that we have this automatic increase in the level of benefits across generations following basically with the average wage, just by the nature of the way the benefit formula works. But once you start receiving benefits, your benefits are indexed by price growth by the consumer price index. Not true with all pensions, not true with all annuities. So that's one good aspect of Social Security. Uh, the monthly benefits, we should really make clear, ever since 1940 have always been paid in full and on time per what's been scheduled in the law. The law has changed from time to time, but all the benefits have always been made. Uh, there has never been a point of missing a beat. Uh, Congress has always acted uh, in a timely fashion whenever a challenge arises, and that has happened several times. Okay, so Social Security actually covers about 95% of our population, either by direct work or perhaps by your spouse's work. There are a few people who work in some state and local government and a few people from way back when who still work uh, in the uh, federal government who are not covered under Social Security, but most are. Uh, right now we have about, as of the end of 2017, 42 million retired worker beneficiaries. You can see 9 million disabled worker beneficiaries, and then we have some widow widowers, uh, and by the way, the by by way of understanding, the widow widow beneficiaries are people who are receiving benefits only as a widow widower because a lot of people receive a retirement benefit and are a widow or widower and may receive something extra as a result. Spouses and children also receive benefits under the program. So mention sort of the three-legged stool concept. Social Security has oftentimes been referred to as the four of protection, sort of the minimum bid. It was never intended to provide everything that people would need in retirement. Um, most financial planners talk about what should you really be aiming for to have by way of income when you stop working and you don't have to go out and buy fancy clothes like some people here have uh, uh, and have to pay all the travel expenses to work back and forth every day and you can live more of a life of leisure, maybe 75 to 80 percent of the income you had while you were working. Uh, will, will suffice. Social Security, uh, how much does it provide? Well, as a little look into that, whoops, as a look into that, we have this little chart that we've, we've shown many times that indicates for people at different earnings levels, the top blue line shows you the so-called benefit replacement rate. That's the amount of money you would expect to get from Social Security if you start your Social Security benefits in retirement at age 65. Uh, and how much that is compared to what your sort of average career, average earnings level has been, all on a nice wage index basis, so you've really got comparability. You can see for a low earner, if you wait till 65, uh, which is, we got this at about the 25th percentile, uh, starting from the bottom up, uh, on lifetime earnings levels, and in the future, it's gonna be out there at around half, uh, which is not quite that 75 to 80 percent. But you can see for people with higher and higher earnings levels, because of the nature of our primary insurance, uh, formula, uh, you can see that for, for the very highest earners, it's down quite a bit less than that, only at about 25%. This is retiring at 65. 
If you retire at 62, it's about 20% less than this. If you wait until 70, which you can, you have fewer years in which you'll get benefits, but your monthly amount is quite a bit bigger. And the one thing to keep in mind on this is uh, this is what's scheduled in law. This is the stated intention by Congress for the benefits in the future. So uh, one of the things that's really important to understand, and I think it's going to be elaborated a lot more by the panel coming up, is that Social Security does provide a really interesting and unique opportunity. CPI-indexed life annuities are not all that available, not all that much tapped into by our populace, but there is a really kind of interesting one that is quite available to folks. If you're considering taking your benefits, say, at 66, which is now basically uh, close to our so-called fuller normal retirement age, if you wait till 70, you get eight percentage points increase in your monthly benefit for each extra year that you wait. So if you wait four extra years, you get a 32% higher benefit for the rest of your life. And it's CPI indexed starting after age 62. So waiting to 66, waiting to 70 doesn't lose you anything. It really gains you. Uh, and this is a way of really buying uh, less expensively than anywhere else you can probably find a CPI indexed life annuity, uh, which may be available elsewhere, but uh, these are pretty good terms. So it's something people should really uh, want to consider about. Now, the other legs of the stool, this is thanks to, you know, uh, Lori and, and, and other people over at uh, – at EBRI, and I was just talking with Lori, this may not be entirely up to date, so it goes through 2014. We don't have uh, the very latest data in here. This is really just to give you an illustration for the other two legs of the stool, which are personal savings, uh, largely through uh, like defined contribution plans being considered here, uh, like 401ks, versus employer provided defined benefit plans. And you can see the blue line here is uh, the total amount, uh, the total percentage of employees that are covered under a defined benefit plan. You can see what's happened since about 1980. It's been dropping a lot. It's been largely offset by folks rising up uh, with defined contribution plans. And you can see the uh, top line across here is the percentage of people that have at least one of them. Uh, so uh, that's been pretty steady at a little bit less than 50%. So there are a lot of people out there that do not have significant employer-provided either DC or DB uh, accumulations and therefore are dependent largely just on what they might have in the bank plus Social Security. Uh, so what does Social Security provide uh, in the future? Showed you the slide before about those replacement rates. We are projecting that as of 2034, uh, our reserves will deplete. Now, sometimes people call this insolvency, as though we're going to close the doors. No. What it means is that as if, if Congress does nothing and all of our projections turn out to be true, we'll reach the point in 2034 where we'll use up our reserves, remember roughly $3 trillion of reserves right now, but monthly income payments from all the current workers will continue. The payroll taxes will roll, and we're expecting as of 2034 reserve depletion, we'll still have about $0.79 cents for every dollar of scheduled benefits to come in. Uh, that would diminish a little bit because of increasing longevity and other factors by the time we got way out to 2092, end of our 75-year period, down to 74 cents on a dollar. Not really much change. Uh, but I guess we would just indicate that uh, being faced with such prospects, uh, Congress has every single time stepped up, and I think we could be pretty confident that they will uh, be changing. I think Ted made a comment, something along about uh, the idea of reforming Social Security. Well, we tend to think of it more of a matter of like some adjustments are needed for Social Security. You can see on this slide, this shows as a percentage of our payroll, of our taxable payroll, uh, what the what the cost of the program is, which is the blue line continued with the dashed line, that's what the cost of providing scheduled benefits is. The solid blue line, we drop it down uh, to show what could actually be paid if Congress does not act and we have to live after 2034 based on just the expected revenue to be coming in. And this is where you see that drop down 21% in 2034, about 26% by the time we get to 2092. You can be pretty sure that Congress won't let that happen. I'm sure you can all imagine good reasons why Congress does not want to, you know, touch the third rail of politics, as it's been often, oftentimes referred to. Uh, so Ted also alluded to the idea of the age of dependency ratio, and this is really, you might ask, why is it that this blue line or the dashed line is rising up so much over the next 20 years? Why is the cost of Social Security compared to our payroll tax base, the, the, all the earnings that people are working uh, and earning and the, that we have the small payroll tax on, well, 12.4%, 6.2% each, small, large. If you compare it to a lot of other countries, it will appear small. So why is it going up? Well, if you look at the black line here, this is this thing we call the age of dependency ratio. 
It's the ratio of the number of people who are 65 and older in our population to the number of people who are historically referred to as working age, from 20 to 64. And you can see all of a sudden this just dashes up. Well, it dashes up, why? Obviously, because the big baby boom is, is moving across this time period into the retirement ages above 65. Actually, it wouldn't be rising up to the age dependency ratio, except for the fact that uh, the baby boom is referred to that. Why? Because of uh, the drop in birth rates after the end of the baby boom. And to help really understand that, we show you these uh, uh, light blue and uh, purple lines below, which is what this age dependency ratio would look like in the future if, at the end of the baby boom generation, we'd stayed at birth rates. Uh, close to either the 3.3 children per woman rate, which was true during the baby boom period, 1946 through 65, or if it had even just stayed at 3.0, we'd see a very gentle rise, really just reflective of what's happening as a result of people's longevity. So it's really, it's really the drop in birth rates, and lest anybody say, oh gosh, you know, Steve Ross is up there saying this is terrible, yeah, the drop in birth rates. I'm so old, I remember this thing about Malthus, we're gonna overpopulate the world, we're all gonna starve to death, we avoided that, but this is but this is what we get. We, we now have to address this issue. Uh, it's, it's a result of having avoided uh, mass starvation. Uh, so solutions for Social Security, what do we have to do? Well, as you can see, this 79 cents on a dollar payable, basically by 2034, we have to either reduce the Congress, has to either reduce the cost of Social Security by about a quarter, or increase the revenue by about a third, or some combination of those two. Uh, we have up on our website uh, over 130 different provisions put forth, not by us, but by members of Congress and some other august groups uh, like, uh, well, almost august, we're getting close, but uh, groups like even the, the American Academy of Actuaries and many other operations, and you can see a whole bunch of those. And as a sense of what some of those are, just giving you a little taste of some of the things that have been considered, solutions. Some solutions that have been considered that would lower the cost of Social Security that can contribute towards that. One is to lower benefits for retirees and not the disabled, and we could do that just by raising the retirement age. Back in the 1983 amendments with a 17-year lag, we were still working on raising the normal retirement age from 65 up to 67. That effectively really lowers, lowers lifetime benefits for retirees. Another one is to lower benefits mainly for high earners. We could just restructure our primary insurance amount formula so that it gives less to the higher earners without even necessarily affecting people at the lower earnings level. Uh, another way is to, uh, is to reduce benefits primarily for the oldest old. Uh, and we could do that simply by reducing the cost of living adjustment. Remember at 62, you don't have any cost of living adjustments. So if we modify the cost of living adjustment, you're not affected. Uh, but when you're 82, you've had 20 years worth of cost of living adjustments. So the oldest told would be most effective. A lot of people say we can save money by using the chain weighted CPI. Others have said we could use the CPIE for the elderly, which would actually give a higher increase for the COLA. And the uh, last little item I have on here in my remaining approximately one minute maybe, is to talk to you a little bit then about some of the things that we considered on the other side of, of the coin here, which is ways to generate some more revenue. Well, obviously our 12.4% payroll tax rate, that could be moved up some, uh, that's, that's a possibility. Another is to do that, but really for the highest earners right now for earnings above 120, well, you, you, you all know what the taxable maximum is, 120,000, and 300, something like 400. Thank you, Karen Glenn. Okay, 128,400. For earnings above that, the, the, the payroll tax rate, and that is, it's zero. So, so it, it could be higher, uh, and we could solve a lot of our shortfall by, by raising the taxable maximum. Uh, and finally, there's one other, which is right now, most of you are probably aware, employer provided group health insurance is not included in the tax base for income tax or for payroll tax. And there has, there's been consideration the possible of bringing that in. That could generate a lot of revenue for Social Security. Uh, it would also potentially give people uh, more earnings that are covered and could elevate their benefits somewhat. And with that, I think I am done. And thank you very much, Lori. And thank you. I think, I, have, I think we do have time for one question. Oh. Um, we're running a very tight schedule here, but let's, uh, if, is there one question for um, Steve? Perhaps not. How'd you get through this I so think we've fast? Got, I think we've got, I think we've okay. got. Okay. <laughs> Cut it way back, right? Anyhow, well, if no questions, thank if you no all very much. no questions, okay. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for um, mentioning the uh, eBreeze analysis of the CPS data. We actually just published an issue brief on this, talking about some of the concerns we have with using the DC coverage stats from the CPS data, and that's why we haven't updated the chart, and we're going to actually discuss this in our 
EBRI Policy Forum in December, so everyone's welcome to join that conversation. In the meanwhile, let's uh, start with our panel and, and starting with Mark. Laurie, thank you. Uh, great to be here with all of you. And uh, I would note that the amount of expertise and experience and knowledge uh, <clears throat> on this side of the stage is uh, uh, at least equal, if not greater, uh, than on, on this side of the stage. Uh, so we're going to have Q&A opportunities to, to get I further ideas and to debate <clears throat> all of this. Uh, let me, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, start with the note that, Steve, uh, your uh, remarkably concise uh, uh, review of the Social Security issues uh, segues neatly to private pension system um, as, you, as you did. And I would note that one way that's particularly interesting uh, and to start off the sort of cascade of lightning round good ideas or interesting ideas is to have the private pension system promote a more thoughtful approach to Social Security claiming. That is to encourage people to think about the decision, when do I claim Social Security? When do I start taking my private pensions, whether it's DB or drawing down a, a DC or an IRA? Uh, and when do I start phasing down my work? Uh, and how much, <clears throat> at what pace? To think of those decisions not as something that automatically has to be grouped together and done at the same time, as some people do, but something that needs to be thought of together and then optimized in terms of coordination and timing. One interesting idea is having the 401k plan offer a Social Security bridge payment so that people will be uh, aware, more aware, <coughs> excuse, me, excuse me, more aware that they can postpone the claiming of Social Security to maximize their monthly annuity somewhere between the earliest age 62 when a, a, a plurality of the people claim to the age 70 maximum. They can do that with the aid of drawing down their private pensions. And uh, 401k could offer a bridge payment the way defined benefit plans uh, traditionally have offered to help you uh, postpone claiming Social Security, thereby maximizing your Social Security annuity. Uh, a, an IRA uh, could do the same thing, and as we'll discuss in a moment, the automatic IRA programs could indeed have something like that. Doesn't force people, doesn't shove people, but raises consciousness that one could claim later, not necessarily reflexively at 62. So what has worked, what has not worked in our system, what can we learn? Just very briefly, I think what has worked uh, very well has been employer plans and uh, the uh, in workplace uh, basis for saving in the United States. $28 trillion of accumulated assets, the greatest pool of investment capital uh, in history. Uh, millions, tens of millions of middle class families who've augmented their Social Security with meaningful private sector uh, benefits. Uh, employer funding and employer initiative has worked. Uh, DB plans, profit sharing, money purchase, may it rest in peace, money purchase <laughs> pension plans, uh, and 401ks, uh, simple IRAs, et cetera. Uh, employer funding, employer initiative, that has worked, and we don't pay enough attention to that. Uh, automatic enrollment and behavioral strategies, automatic escalation, uh, Thaler, Ben Artsy, Save More Tomorrow, that all has worked rather dramatically uh, in, the, in the 401k system. What has not worked? I guess number one on my list would be Congress. <laughs> and we'll return to that and elaborate a bit more, although I'm not sure I need to elaborate much to, to this group. 
Second, employer plans uh, have not worked as the coverage closer, that is the final solution to, uh, to the coverage issue that still remains. It, we've done a great job of covering roughly two-thirds of the working population, uh, not a great job of covering the other third or so, some 55 million working families. So <clears throat> we've tried, we've been encouraging, incenting uh, more employer plans, <coughs> excuse me, small businesses, especially where the coverage is the spottiest, uh, but we haven't really broken through on that. IRAs on a standalone basis have worked very well for portability, uh, but not for closing the coverage gap. One out of 10 or so people who could contribute to an IRA in a given year actually does so, uh, compared to you know, seven or eight out of 10 for employer plans, and with auto enrollment, as we know, nine out of 10 or even a fraction more. Workplace savings, having worked quite well to a great extent, uh, could be offered without requiring an employer plan to be provided or without having successfully persuaded in our voluntary system an employer to provide one through payroll deduction IRAs. That is through payroll deduction that instead of feeding a 401k feeds an IRA that the employer has no responsibility for, no fiduciary duties, no uh, compliance with much of our uh, structure of uh, ERISA and plan qualification rules if we can't get what we really want, which is getting the employer to uh, take on uh, those compliance um, issues and provide a true employer plan. So payroll deduction IRA, which at Treasury we tried to, to promote in the late 1990s, uh, that has not worked on a voluntary basis. We uh, uh, suggested that you could get all the tax benefits of an IRA with the benefits of payroll deduction as the delivery mechanism. Uh, virtually none were adopted on a voluntary basis. Uh, I uh, was working with Larry Summers at the time when I was at Treasury, and he was uh, Deputy Secretary and then Secretary, and he asked me, Mark, this payroll deduction IRA idea sounds great, uh, but is it voluntary or mandatory? What are you thinking? And I said, absolutely voluntary. You know, we have to try that. And mandates as a last resort, just generally speaking, including here. Well, we tried it for about eight years, and uh, virtually none were adopted, Re truly de minimis. So that suggests that perhaps combining the elements that have worked payroll deduction where it's an employer has set it into motion, automatic enrollment, uh, and the use of IRAs as tax-favored uh, vehicles. And of course, tax incentives have worked to some considerable extent, but not uh, as, as far as we would, to the extent we would like to solve coverage. So putting together these pieces and requiring employers to do payroll deduction IRAs is what gave rise to the proposal that David John and I developed uh, for automatic enrollment in IRAs, taking the successful auto enrollment and other behavioral techniques, including escalation of contributions, and extending them to the 55 million people who don't have an employer plan in which to provide those. So we rolled that out at the Heritage Foundation 2006. Uh, that did uh, catch on on a bipartisan basis. We got lots of support. The presidential candidates in 2008 both endorsed it, John McCain, Barack Obama. Uh, it, uh, it was uh, uh, proposed on the Hill by Republicans and Democrats, uh, but uh, we had the Obamacare uh, proposal that worked its way through Congress <clears throat> in a manner that caused all kinds of political sequelae that we're familiar with, divisiveness, hyper-partisanship that were already there and were somewhat further exacerbated by the Affordable Care Act experience. So uh, 
auto IRAs uh, then uh, were, were on, the, um, on the agenda to come after Obamacare, uh, but were really uh, uh, hampered then by the divisiveness in Congress and their association more with Obama than with the many people on the, uh, on the right and on the Republican side who supported them. So the idea, again, is requiring an employer that has chosen not to sponsor a plan to automatically enroll its employees into a payroll deduction IRA managed by the private sector. Open architecture, all the IRA providers that now, uh, industries that now provide IRAs would be able to participate provided the fees are uh, reasonable uh, and that the investments conform to a QDIA-like template, target date fund default, uh, that sort of thing, a uh, small uh, uh, menu. And the, the real win here would be for a nationwide program of automatic IRAs for employees of employers who don't sponsor a plan voluntarily to spur more sponsorship of plans. That is, 401ks would hopefully increase as the marketing of 401ks and other employer plans gets easier in conjunction with the, this kind of uh, requirement. Now, since uh, Obamacare's uh, uh, consequences uh, created a political issue here, Congress has not acted on the nationwide uniform uh, automatic IRA, which incidentally would provide a tax credit for the employer, so it would be essentially costless. Certainly no employer contributions, no employer fiduciary liability, uh, and a private sector uh, run program apart from the employer requirement. The states started to take that up, and now I would argue that the major unfinished business of ERISA, that is coverage, uh, is now being pursued most effectively uh, through this effort in six states that have now legislated to adopt uh, the automatic IRA template. Five of them strikingly similar, almost identical to the federal proposal. Uh, not diverse, conflicting requirements, but fairly uniform. Uh, and then New York, most recently, with three and a half million or so estimated people who'd be auto-enrolled, all told, we're talking about something like 13 million working families who'd be auto-enrolled into uh, payroll deduction IRAs run by the private sector, investment managed by the private sector in the states that have adopted this legislation so far, uh, as opposed to the several dozen that are uh, thinking about it and have proposals pending. I would argue that if we can solve coverage, and the state movement, I believe, has a great chance of doing it by being consolidated and ultimately placed under a federal umbrella, uh, that as the states, smaller states especially, join up with the larger to get economies of scale, we may see consortia, we may see regional programs that ultimately Congress uh, assembles into a single nationwide uh, auto IRA system per the original proposal and provides a federal tax credit to encourage uh, this to go down easily. Uh, that would be a great platform also for lifetime income with uh, tens of millions of new participants under somewhat uniform, simplified, and behaviorally intelligent strategies. We will also need, of course, adequacy, preservation of benefits, uh, and lifetime income. And very briefly, to just uh, tick off a few of the interesting ideas, among many others, uh, in those areas. When it comes to adequacy, let's not forget about employer contributions. We've been enthusiastic to encourage employees to save more, you know, save 10 percent of your uh, pay, terrific, uh, save 12 or more percent if you can. The employer match should not be allowed to quietly walk off stage while we're emphasizing auto enrollment and employee contributions. 
we didn't approve auto-enrollment with the idea that it would be a substitute for employer contributions, and happily, it's not, generally speaking, so far. But I would uh, emphasize that we need to keep the employer contribution within our, on our radar screen, even though it is entirely a voluntary uh, matter from a legal standpoint. When it comes to preservation of assets, we know that if we are successful in accumulating more, it doesn't deliver the desired policy outcome if the assets leak out of the system for short-term consumption. So three interesting ideas in this area that I think are worth focusing on. One, emergency savings accounts. If we can get people uh, a discrete place to save in a very liquid way, whether attached to a 401k or independent of it, uh, we may be able to remove an obstacle to saving and also uh, remove a source of leakage. This is your leaky account. This is the money, and it could be quite small, a couple $3,000, uh, or ideally more than that, ideally uh, six months of pay per the financial planning advice, but even starting with $1,000 per that Federal Reserve finding that a $400 expense is something that 44% of Americans can't meet with existing savings and would have to borrow or sell something. Uh, that could uh, very much help the leakage problem that we now have in our employer plans. A second idea would be why make the 401k the leakage machine that it is? Uh, why let it continue that way? Every time someone terminates employment, they're offered their money. Sure, the default is it stays in the plan, but the practical aspect is that they're offered their money. We could say that new money, further future contributions, will be paid out upon termination of employment only in a rollover, a direct rollover to another plan or an IRA, or retained in the plan. Uh, as they are by default now, or if the individual has a hardship, uh, paid as a lump sum. And obviously, an annuity would also be fine. But the lump sums that we now pay reflexively when people change jobs need not be paid. It would be reasonable if the person didn't have a new job and was truly unemployed to let them access that money it's not necessary to let them access that money and spend it when we could otherwise keep it in the plan, roll it over, pay an annuity if they're old enough, or make it available to them as a lump sum if they are old enough, if they're retirement age. And thirdly, I'd mention uh, Spencer Williams and Tom's uh, retirement clearinghouse as another great idea that would help stem leakage by rolling money from employer plan to the next employer plan by seeking out the uh, uh, new employer plan in the data available on the individual. When it comes to lifetime income, I'll take a second on each of several other good ideas. Oh, we're graying out the ones before. So these are, um, I'll start with the fact that I think Treasury and IRS, uh, during the previous administration, worked with the Labor Department to try to encourage lifetime income in our private pension system. And we had a kind of field theory of how to overcome the behavioral obstacles. And that was very simply stated, don't go for all or nothing. Don't ask people to buy an annuity with their entire nest egg in their 401k or in their IRA use a uh, more incremental, uh, uh, limited approach to get people involved in lifetime income uh, so that they could then expand if they need to. Those who don't need it, who have a DB plan already, don't need to convert their DCs to lifetime income, don't have to, but without purporting to force, without forcing or purporting to advise people what some optimal amount is, Let's start small and start partial. So one idea, the QLAC, Qualified Longevity Annuity Contracts, uh, this was something that uh, 
my colleagues at Treasury did a great job with Harlan Weller in particular, postpone the annuity until 80 or 85, allow people to start it and, and it will last for life after that, uh, and uh, the cost of the annuity becomes typically a meaningful annuity, could be 15% of your account balance, 20% of your account balance, to get a very substantial increment to Social Security when 15 or 20 years later, after you bought it, if you bought it in your 60s, started when you were 80 or 85, the money has grown in the insurance company to be able to fund a much more substantial annuity. This is very anti all or nothing. You're taking a little chunk of your account balance from a behavioral standpoint, an easier sell than give the insurance company your whole account balance and then what if I get hit by the proverbial bus after leaving the insurance agent's office. These can also have a return of premium on debt uh, to mitigate that concern. A second approach would be QDIA embedded annuities and we put out guidance at Treasury and IRS on each of these in the last few years. The uh, uh, idea is we have a target date fund that's really worked as a, as a mechanism for guiding people toward more sensible investments in their qualified plans, in their 401ks in particular. You could embed an annuity in it. It has to have a fixed income exposure as part of the target date fund or for that matter a balanced fund or a managed account. The, t the fixed income exposure, asset exposure, could be uh, a fixed annuity that would accumulate over time and then spring into lifetime retirement income uh, at retirement. person could opt out of that later, but by default that's what they would get. Labor gave us a very nice letter uh, uh, several years ago saying this is a QDIA. Uh, you can put an annuity in your target date fund and it's still a QDIA for employer uh, uh, fiduciary protection. John Turner uh, and I uh, wrote about this uh, uh, back in 2008 or so, and we were happy to, to be able to implement this at, at Treasury. Another thought is what I call bifurcation, uh, with a, a K in the middle, if you will. This, this thought is you could, it's only supposed to have one hyphen, by for hyphen K hyphen. Okay, the, the idea is that employers could take their employer contributions and upgrade their 401k. I talked earlier about not paying a lump sum reflexively on every termination of employment, but rather trying to limit it to hardship situations, which of course plan sponsors would have to administer, but you could potentially get the financial provider, the record keeper to administer that uh, to mitigate the, that concern. An employer could be more forward looking, could say, you know what, I'm not going to mess with the employee's contributions, but I make a match. I'm going to take half of my match and it'll be an annuity, a deferred annuity that'll accumulate incrementally over time and that'll pay lifetime income upon retirement. Uh, and people perhaps could opt out of that at, if they wanted to, but that's what I'll make the default. I'll have a default annuity in my plan. There's, in addition to the idea of implanting it in the target date fund, this would just say, I'm going to do what I want with the match because this is my employer money, and if I want to be paternalistic a bit, uh, I can. Nothing prevents me from doing that. Fiduciary standards, of course, you have to be uh, selecting an annuity uh, prudently and, and all the rest, and hopefully the RISA a safe harbor will help us with that. Uh, but that's another way an employer could move the ball forward. You could say just new money, matches from here on, just half the match. Similarly, leakage. You could say whether or not that's an annuity, I'm going to make it a non-leaky contribution. You can't get at this contribution until you're age 55. Or you can roll it over anytime you want, but if you want it paid out of the plan, uh, I'll treat it like that earlier idea about having a 401k that doesn't pay lump sums except upon hardship or attainment of, let's say, age 60 or, or thereabouts. So that you could bifurcate your K plan as an employer. 
self-annuitization. This is the idea that an employer could use its DB plan if it has one. Even a frozen plan or a cash balance, non-frozen cash balance plan, as an annuity factory for employees. Employee wants to roll a lump sum from their 401k into the employer's DB, they could do that. This is, we uh, made clear that this is current law and permissible, and thereby get the cheapest annuity available. Uh, not a commercial annuity, but an annuity from the defined benefit plan, in addition to all of our efforts to promote commercial annuities in defined contribution plans and IRAs. Uh, as well, and in addition, let me emphasize this, to our efforts to promote retirement income in non-annuity form as well, be it a managed payout, a mutual fund product, a bank product that might not guarantee lifetime income, but could get pretty close and give regular income uh, payments. Uh, another great idea, I think, is trial annuitization. Uh, Bill Gale, David John, Lena Walker, and I wrote about this some years ago. You could have a plan give people a two-year test drive of an annuity. Uh, it could be a, an installment payout, but when they reach retirement age, they could try out monthly payments, let's say, for 24 months, and at the end of that, they'd be defaulted into an annuity or could opt out of the annuity uh, and say, you know, I, didn't, I don't want to do that, I want a lump sum. Or, best of all, split it uh, to optimize the portion that is lifetime income. Speaking of splitting it, the defined benefit plans today could, again, adopt this uh, uh, sort of field theory of encouraging lifetime income demand by getting away from the all or nothing choice. So many of them just allow you to take the various kinds of required options of annuities, the default lifetime annuities, JNS, et cetera, or a lump sum, as opposed to how much of your benefit do you want in a lump sum, how much do you want in an annuity. We'll split it in various ways, uh, and you can optimize. That partial annuitization is something else that we encouraged in guidance to make it actuarially more convenient, administratively more convenient. Harlan Weller, again, was the star on, on that guidance. DB plans could promote lifetime income much more than they now do. It's the lowest hanging fruit in the lifetime income landscape, but we're not really pursuing it. Finally, I'll mention required minimum distribution reform. The RMD rules, the age 70 and a half requirements, you start taking, uh, taxing some of your benefit, not necessarily taking it out. We could exempt a majority of seniors from that. And we proposed this at Treasury several years ago. It's made it into uh, uh, the uh, ranking member, Richie Neal's uh, legislative proposals, as had of, has the auto IRA, uh, to uh, tell people if they have an account balance of less than X, aggregating all their IRAs and K plans, and even uh, you could look at DB equivalents. If they have less than X, let's say, in terms of account balance aggregated, they're exempt no RMDs. It's an anti-estate tax policy. These are not the people we need to worry about. If they have less than 250000 is the amount in the Neal bill, uh, you could pick a, a lower amount, a slightly higher amount. But basically, the beauty of this is it's progressive. It lets the, the littler guys off the hook entirely with respect to compliance with this RMD complex set of rules. No worry about the 50% excise tax or any excise tax for failing to comply. And most importantly, it's enactable because it's cheap. It doesn't score high because these people need the money anyway, but not necessarily at that precise rigid payout rate. So it scores quite modestly if you keep the threshold down. Uh, shall we mix it up now? That's a lot of great ideas, and now we'll turn to Ted to hear about uh, preparing for retirement. Okay. Thanks, Mark. A uh, ton of great ideas. Um, 
And uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Our, our goal today really is to share as many ideas as we think we can uh, that, that are practical and realistic and try to stimulate the thinking. So I think Mark got us to a good start. And uh, I think the, the, um, his, his ideas, are, I think, are ones that have been um, largely talked about and, and somewhat in the oven. What I'm going to talk about are a little less baked. Um, but nonetheless, I think have a lot of potential. I, I want to get into my list of ideas sooner rather than later, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time just to, this setup here of, um, you know, I, I, actually, I think, you know, our, our major goals of policy are getting people covered. These are the kind of the normal things, so I'm not going to spend time on that. And there's also a list of gaps and barriers that uh, go far and wide and deep uh, that I'm not going to go into as well. Well, I actually should talk about a few of these. I think uh, I'll get to them as I go through some of the solutions. But uh, I think one of the points I want to make is we can't talk about retirement in a vacuum. Uh, I, I've spent my whole career talking about retirement solutions and problems and funding and design and realize that you kind of lose a big chunk of the audience that isn't near retirement when you start talking about only retirement and people have other priorities in their life. So I think that's something we got to keep in mind as we go through solutions is how do we, how do we balance real life with uh, real solutions here. And, and I think another barrier is getting the employers into the game. Uh, there's, we live in such a litigious society that you know, we're still seeing lawsuits on 401k fees and uh, you know, we've got to the point where any employer to, to do something outside of the clear bounds of what's allowable and what's not, uh, as soon as they do that, there's somebody willing to say, I've been wronged and, and uh, I'm so everybody's shut down and they're not going to take any risks. They're not going to get out there and put, put in new ideas and solutions. Uh, the home equity is another piece of the puzzle that I think is, it seems to me it's sitting there. You know, most, a lot of people when they get to retirement, the, as much as 50% of their assets could be tied up in the equity in their home, yet it's illiquid and, uh, and very difficult to, to tap into. So we need to find ways to bring home, home equity into the solution. And then there's the, the usual risks of uh, longevity risk and investment risk and the volatility there that's, that we talked about before that made it harder, and we need affordable options as well. So I'm going to share a list of thoughts, uh, again, to stimulate some thinking here. My first idea is around the, the behavioral side of things, and, and I started thinking about you know, what's, you know, I grew up as a defined benefit actuary, so I have this bias toward defined benefit plans, I'll be honest with that up front. But one of the things I thought that made DB plans so effective is you go to work for your employer, and if, you're, if you decide to stay for that employer, you're fortunate enough to stay for that employer for your, your whole career, a big chunk of that career, you work, you retire, and probably the only decision you had to make about your retirement was whether you wanted a 50% or 100% J&S benefit. Otherwise, you know, something happened behind the scenes and you, and you walked away with this income for the rest of your life. I mean, how good is that, right? It's like Halloween. It doesn't get any better than that. So how do we, you know, we move from that to, to the defined contribution environment where you're, you're now asked to make all these decisions. So how do we bring DC plans more in line with DB plans? And first thought I had was, you know, we, we've been doing it backwards all these years. Uh, we, we, you go to work for your employer, here's all your information, uh, see you later, good luck with that, by the way. I'll go back to the picture of the guy with the help sign. Um, we, don't, we don't, there's help there, but it's, it's hard to uh, decipher all this. What if instead, and in today's day and, and age, we know a lot about people through technology, through, um, uh, if you work an employer, we know what your salary is, we know how old you are, we know what's in your 401k account balance, we know if you have a DB plan from that employer, we know we can project what Social Security is going to be. So we have a lot of the important pieces. So rather than, and auto enrollment has been very successful by all stretches of the imagination that Mark talked about, but it treats everybody the same. I mean, what if we said, I have good news, I'll be Oprah today, and we'll give everybody new shoes in the audience. Uh, the problem is they're all size six. So there's going to be a couple people pretty happy about that, but most of the people <laughs> are, are not going to be able to get the full utilization of those shoes. And so why not do the same thing in defined contribution plans? We know some things about you, so we know we can take some of the measurements. So why don't we start you at an auto, auto, automatic enrolled amount, but at your personalized rate? So Mark might be in it at 8%, and Steve's going to be in at 12%, and Lori's going to be in at 14% because she hasn't saved as much as uh, Steve and, and, and Mark did. But it gives you an idea of saying, this is, we're going to put you on a path to a secure retirement. 
So we're going to default you at this personalized rate. I think that idea alone is, is worth a lot, and I'd like to see us get there. And again, the idea is to have policy support this, because I think employers would, would shudder to say, I'm not going to put people in at some, some high rate without their permission type of thing. So we need to break down these barriers. But then you think about it, if that were to be effective, so we're starting you out on a path to secure retirement, but things happen, and we did a lot of assumptions to calculate marks 8%. And so maybe periodically, maybe it's on demand, maybe it's every year, maybe it's every three years, we recalculate that calculation for Mark and say, you know what, we, you are at a, a clip of 8% was what you needed to have a secure retirement, but uh, we've had some investment, uh, bad per investment performance, now it needs to go to 9%, and we're going to automatically move you to 9%. So in a sense, it's doing what a DB plan did, is automatically adjusting for what happens during your life and keeping you on that path to secure retirement. And if the opposite were true, where we've actually, we've had gains and we could reduce you from eight to seven, we might say, well, you know, we're going to keep you at eight and build up a little reserve there for some rainy day down the future. So you're in a program now that starts you at a place that makes sense for you, keeps you on that path to secure retirement all the way to retirement. And I'd say the probability of accumulating more wealth and more people reaching that, that an appropriate accumulation would be significantly higher. Uh, and, and, and it's not perfect. It's not intended to be perfect. So if you think about saving for retirement is throwing darts at a board and the bullseye is exactly the amount you need to live happily ever after, this strategy by no means would get you the bullseye and it's not going to pretend to. But I would argue it gives you a better chance of getting on the dart board. And right now people are throwing those darts and they're barely hitting the wall, even if they're picking up the darts to throw them. We've got some people who aren't doing that. So I think this idea of kind of this personalized DC plan that adjusts all the way through retirement I have a drawdown piece of it too, but I'm not going to go into that today. But I think it has a lot of potential and should be thought about. A second uh, a, a sub, a group of ideas have to do with risk pooling. You know, it, pooling, uh, again, being putting my actuarial hat on is a really important way to, to mitigate risk. Uh, you know, imagine if you had to insure your own car for everything or your own house uh, or your own life for that matter. Uh, you just couldn't do it, right, to take that on by yourself. And that's really what we're doing with defined contribution plans is putting the entire risk on the backs of the individual. So how can we retain some of that pooling, pooling investments and having professionals manage those assets and have a longer time horizon to be able to withstand some of the ups and downs, pooling that longevity risk? What are ways that we can do that? Well, one idea is the, uh, there's been a lot of um, proposals uh, leading to what's called multiple employer plans, which the main focus of the multiple employer plan is to allow small employers to band together to encourage more uh, sponsorship of programs, getting more people to save, the, to, to accumulate wealth. Well, I, I think we should extend, if we get to the point where the multiple employer plans are, 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 are available, why not extend that to a retiree multiple employer plan, open, open MEP, we'll call it, retiree open MEP. In this, in this scenario, you'd have organizations that sponsor the program, but instead of doing the wealth accumulation, they would do the, the drawdown phase of it. So employers would be able to hand over. I mean, most employers do not want to, though they're happy to do it, they would rather not, if they had a good option, would hand over the assets of their retirees to, a, to a, an able organization that would help those retirees in a much better way that the employer can or is interested in helping them today. So you can see where when you retire, you transfer your account, your 401k account, defined contribution account to this retiree MEP. And this organization is a specialist in managing retire, retirees. And so that the organization would not sell any of its own product. So it would be purely a, a, a best, in, best interest, to borrow the, the dead fiduciary rule language, um, to, to help the retiree would be their sole purpose. And that would be, if you want an annuity, we'll go search the, the marketplace and find you options to buy the best annuity and let you choose from amongst ones that are well-priced and, and strong organizations. If you want to invest the money, we'll have a, a group of asset managers that we can help you assess and, and, uh, and get to. Um, so the, um, uh, uh, I think this is an idea that would allow people to really become experts in managing that retirement piece of this and, uh, and move us forward from that perspective. So open retiree maps, something to think about. The next one is uh, DC risk pool. Uh, and here, uh, right now in defined contribution plan, that individual account belongs to the individual. Well, what if... I'm going to get into the tontine world a little bit here, but I won't call it a tontine. You didn't hear me say that. 
Um, but what if you were able to take, uh, as, as Mark kind of said on, on the on the QLAC, you could take a portion of your your account and buy a deferred annuity. What if you took a portion of your account and put it in a risk risk pool? And that risk pool could be dedicated to just longevity. It could be dedicated to offsetting inflation. It could be dedicated to offsetting investment risks. Uh, all kinds of things that it could um, could could. Uh, uh, be dedicated to, but you'd be in the class with everybody else who retired when you retired, so that money would be pooled and, uh, and then be able to be used only for the purpose for which it's intended. And it's not insurance because when the money runs out, it runs out and everybody's in the same boat, but as people would die, more money would be available to those that remain to cover that risk and, uh, and could be done within the plan, and low cost, and not, not involve any profit, anybody making profit from that and so forth. So an interesting way to, to kind of pool that risk and, and then there would be no one big winner at the end of the day. The money would roll over into uh, either go back to the heirs of that class so they would always benefit from that money that was set aside or could roll over to the next class. And I, I think people would not mind as much if they shared that, that, that money with their, their fellow workers that they that had a common employment with, even if they didn't know them personally. It's still a better bond. Than, going to some, some risk pool that you didn't know anybody else in that risk pool. So another interesting idea. The, the third risk uh, pooling idea has to do with an emerging plan design that has taken on several names, depending on which country you're from. And it's just really started more from areas like the Netherlands and Canada have been forward thinking on this, uh, Japan, and I think Germany now, too. It's been called defined ambition, DB risk sharing collective defined contribution plans. In the US, the term composite plans has been used in relationship to multi-employer plan solutions. And here the concept is, you know, we're, we're on this constant quest of balancing DB and DC. And there's a lot of good things in DB plans. And, and this would be a way to say, look, we're going to have a program that has a DB formula. We're going to do everything we can to fund this to get you to deliver that benefit that we've been, that we've, the formula says we want to deliver. But we live in an uncertain world, and if things go bad, we, the employer in this case, says, I'm not going to be on the hook for some unfunded liability that I can't manage and I can't control. So we will make adjustments to the plan to make sure that there's never an unfunded liability. And if we have to, we reduce benefits, increase contributions. We have a whole list of solutions that we can make looking at the whole plan uh, in total as opposed to looking at uh, just a, a piece of that. Uh, so so I, I think these programs have a lot of merit and it's something we should pay a lot of attention to. And, and I think it was Japan that recently passed a law allowing these types of designs before anybody even expressed interest in that. I mean, can you imagine that happening in our country where we're forward thinking and saying, here's a good idea, let's open the gates and make it easy for employers to migrate to this. Uh, that would be terrific. Mark? We've actually done that, Ted. I mean, as, as you know, the, uh, the Treasury had proposals from uh, some of the private sector to have variable annuity plans like this, and uh, they were approved. Uh, IRS approved them as qualified, and Treasury sort of said to encouraging things about it. It was not taken up by more than, as far as we can tell, by many more than the people who had proposed them for particular workforces. So, you know, I think it's partly a matter of public marketing, partly a matter of competitive advantage, but we've sort of done what yeah. Japan has done. And we've seen some of that in the multi-employer space and the public plan space, yeah. too. We're starting to see a lot right. of hybrid designs that right. have been very creative. So it's, it's out there, but it's so slow and so painful to get it to be mainstream. And, and you know, I think the DB train is probably pretty far gone, so we've got to find ways to re-energize some of these ideas and get people unafraid to, to jump in. Uh, the, the third area that I want to talk about was this, this view that we can't isolate retirement. And, and I call this financial wellness um, because I really think people, um, uh, and as Mark alluded to, we need to stop the leakage and things like emergency funds. I don't understand why we have to make it so difficult and have 401k plan is separate from your HSA, your health savings account, which is separate from your DB plan, which is separate from your uh, financial planning. I mean, people don't look at life that way. And if we can have a program that allows you to save money, to prioritize where that savings goes to, maybe the employer match, you know, the first priority is to pay off your student loan, and the next priority is to 
uh, have an emergency fund. And then when those are all done, then the match starts going into the 401k, the re your retirement account uh, type of thing. So um, I, I really think that um, uh, uh, looking at this on a holistic basis and having plans and structures that allow people to manage their life rather than segments of their life would, would open tremendous doors and bring us a long way. And then the last one, I, I have admittedly less uh, concrete ideas for how to do this, but it's another one of those things that just feels like there's something there and we, we should do a better job at this, and that is the incentives uh, to, to realign incentives for employers uh, through safe harbors or, or tax purposes to employees, to individuals to save, to providers to come up with innovative solutions. I mean, the drug companies get there. If they come up with a drug, they get to protect it for a while before it becomes generic, right? So there's things out there that I think we should be doing. And uh, Mark, you were going to talk about the savers credit. It would be another example of, um, uh, of uh, you know, ideas where maybe the, I think the employer match has been a tremendous incentive for people to participate in their plans. People call it free money. Well, what if the, instead of a tax deduction, that deduction went directly into your retirement account for everybody uh, to, to, to encourage uh, more savings? So I think the, the, the savings, the incentivized, incentivization of uh, all of the parties and all the stakeholders is really necessary to, um, to move us forward. So. Thanks for the time on, on these ideas. Uh, do we have time for a discussion of this? Or is, OK. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Um, so yeah, we have time for questions. Uh, if you are watching us by live stream, please uh, send them in. Otherwise, if you're in the room, please raise your hand. Got one right up front. And please let us know who you are. Okay. Uh, John Turner, Pension Policy Center. Uh, first, there was a lot of great ideas and discussion, and I have you know, various comments, but I'm going to stick to two points which were not addressed, and since you're looking for ideas, just throw two more ideas in. To me, uh, one of the most important issues in the pension area is rollovers from 401ks to IRAs. That generally, rollovers are a bad idea because you generally pay higher fees and have lower fiduciary protection. But it's just pervasive in the retirement income system I just walking over here from the metro uh, stop, a bank was saying, roll over your 401k here at this bank. I think it's a huge issue that should be addressed. Uh, the second one may not seem like such a big issue, but I think there's a lot of money involved. And that is that um, there are some um, DC accounts with over $100 million in the accounts, uh, huge accounts. And um, other countries have caps on the allowable uh, tax preference accounts, we have no such caps. And you may think that RMDs eventually capture uh, the tax preference, at least to some extent, but there are exceptions to RMDs that permit people to um, not take them, you know, postpone taking them. So I think that uh, it's, it affects a small number of people, but a large amount of money is this issue about uh, these very large accounts. Thank you. Um, Mark, Ted, do you have some comments? Uh, I do. And, and John, uh, I, I think your points are really well taken, as, as always. Obviously, as you well appreciate, and I think it's, it's obvious to everyone, uh, there's a small thing called politics that gets in the way here. And not just politics, but you know, in our attempt to maintain a private pension system consistent with our basic national ideological bent to, toward voluntariness, toward private sector primacy, toward minimizing government. We have, in fact, differing interests. Your rollover example is perfect. Uh, we don't all agree that rolling over from an employer plan to an IRA is usually a bad idea. Many people would agree that if the fees are higher in the IRA, and uh, since there's no fiduciary protection there, or usually, uh, in those circumstances, it's probably not a good idea. But a large part of our stakeholder group would take issue even with that. Say, no, no, uh, never mind the higher fees. 
we're getting those higher fees, right? It's, uh, it's okay, and we're giving people a much wider choice. You can invest in Bolivian satellite bonds in our IRA. You can invest in anything you want. You don't have to be stuck into that narrow target date fund or only those 18 choices that your 401k gives you. We've got thousands of investments. So, John, I mean, many of us here might agree that the better policy is obvious, but I think there are some ultimate constraints, as we all know, on persuading uh, the system as a whole to go there. And that's why I was suggesting earlier that of all the things that hasn't worked, that haven't worked really well so far, I have to put Congress on the list. So, I've, um, Ted, I've got a question for you. Um, you mentioned the uh, personalized auto enrollment, but earlier in your presentation, you also talked about the uh, legal liability that employers face and, the, and, and how um, many employers are very concerned about um, being sued uh, for the actions that they take with their defined contribution plans. Um, how would you mitigate the concern that plan sponsors might have to say, well, if I use this um, personalized auto enrollment and I get it wrong, I, I, I don't have them save enough for retirement, um, how am I going to be on the hook? Well, two, two answers. So one, one is I would argue that you're more at risk by having asking them to do everything and giving them no direction or defaulting them at a 3% rate than you are at defaulting them at something that was rationally determined. And, uh, but I would lose that argument with most, most legal centers, so I won't, won't push that one, but that's how I believe. Uh, but secondly, I think part of the, the, the reason for sharing this is a policy issue. I think if policy could open the door to these types of ideas and make it easy for employers to jump in the pool and do these types of things, I think we could get there. I think these ideas have a lot of potential, but the, we've got a, 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 an unwilling uh, participant base to, to do to to get into it. I think Ted and I had a, a, a great, very brief two-hour discussion of this <laughs> a few weeks ago. Uh, I think it's a, you know, that, that your thinking on this is fantastic, uh, but I raised a number of implementation ideas, concerns, if you will, that I think one would have to work with, and I think you were in agreement on, yeah. about some of those, um, among other things, what we're really talking about is can we democratize financial planning? You know, we can't afford a financial planner of the conventional sort for every American family. But we must be able to find some ways to uh, reduce the cost to simplify the process. The QDIA is one that, in effect, it has done a little of that for participants in 401k plans. Uh, and as you suggest, we should be able to do a lot better and personalize a lot more. But we have to figure out how to mitigate the cost of that right. so that it's practical. Managed accounts have taken a step in that direction, right? Right. I mean, you see the robo uh, right. advisors now are, to, are gaining some momentum. There's still some question of how effective those will be over the long run. But so we've stuck a toe in this area. But why not extend that to other decision-making processes? I mean, I would extend it all the way through the financial wellness decision-making process. People struggle making these decisions, and they're decisions you don't make every day, so you're not well informed to do that. You know, when you go buy a house, you're at such a disadvantage to the, to the realtors that are doing this all the time. So we need to, to be able to break it down, use experts who know the situation, know you, know things about you, and can bring you a, a, a solutions that work. And I think that's a great point, that the robos are now fintech is moving into very much what you're talking about, the decumulation phase. How do you spend down your assets? What's the optimal way? Uh, how do you relate that to Social Security claiming? Uh, how do you convert, what do you convert to annuities? What don't you, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of pitfalls, as we know, or suboptimal steps one could take in retirement. It's not that simple, uh, but with FinTech and robos and uh, other sort of managed account approaches, we are moving in that direction. Right. Mark, um, another question for you. Um, 
You uh, mentioned you started your presentation saying that employer plans work very well, um, and uh, with some caveats, but um, then talked about the the gap and filling the gap with a, a payroll deduction IRA. You know, in a similar vein to what I, I asked Ted, um, is there a concern that employers would use that opportunity to exit the system, the four hundred one k system, if we had that um, payroll deduction IRA in place because of things like the litigation risk? Yeah. So, uh, no, I don't think there is a valid concern of that. I think that groups like ASPA, who make their living, the American Retirement Association now, selling 401ks and servicing DBs and selling some small cash balance DBs as well, they have supported auto IRAs because they recognize that the potential of that huge expansion of coverage is to generate more 401ks, not to crowd out 401ks. It's the small business market where we have the, the greatest coverage gap, as we all know, requiring small employers to at least use their unused capacity, their payroll system, to give people a convenient way to save uh, if the employer is not willing to sponsor a plan, is key and will generate uh, more 401ks as the marketing has a new peg, a new occasion to come to employers and say, well, you can go into this required <coughs> payroll deduction IRA, and uh, that's, that's fine, but you can do better. You can have an actual 401k, and you can make a match if you want to, and people contrib can contribute 18500 or 6000 in addition to that if they're age 50 or older, and have employer money in our 401k. You can contribute 5,500 or 6,500 in a in an IRA. No comparison. So I think the incentive for an employer to drop a 401k or even to not adopt a 401k if it was about to, because it has a payroll deduction IRA option, is de minimis. And the tra attraction and retention um, uh, uh, for an employer to attract and retain talent and manage workforces too, I think is. Is, will help that issue. Right. You can't drop your employer match uh, for, for the people who are eligible for perhaps a, an auto IRA and keep it for your executives. You couldn't, you couldn't differentiate the employer match and meet non-discrimination rules. So you'd have to, if you're dropping your K for one of these things, you have to drop the employer match for everybody, including the people who care the most and get the most out of it. And that's a big employee relations takeaway. We have a question in the back. Yeah, oh, I actually moved over here. Jason Seligman from ICI. Um, so a lot of interesting ideas, very very quickly drawn out. Some of them I think we've heard a lot of, about in the past. One of them, though, I, I'm a little concerned about restricting people's uh, access to their own money, especially at job change. Mm -hmm. um, we call it leakage, but uh, I think that it, it might actually uh, tie back to a person's willingness to contribute in the first place, uh, and especially because it's such an important contingency. Uh, not only uh, later in life for people that are displaced, and you mentioned hardship, but also earlier in life for making investments in human capital and for reassessing preferences, job skills, and uh, career trajectories. And so I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that and what would be excluded, and I have profound concerns. Thank you. Jason, I think that's a great point, a great set of points and, and good questions. So what I have in mind there is to uh, have something like the hardship rules that we now have for in-service withdrawals. We don't uh, find ourselves unable to live with those restrictions, which were developed you know, in a world where we thought people would stay with the same job for much or most of their career. So the thought here is, yeah, you could pay college tuition w upon termination of employment with your funds, perhaps, if you had a, just the way the hardship rules uh, or the 72T, 10% penalty exceptions, can allow payments for college tuition, depending on the K or an IRA, which set of rules. That's the kind of thing uh, I'm talking about. You could limit it to the employer match, as I was saying earlier, bifurcate the plan say, because we want people to contribute, to your point, uh, we want them to have reasonable access to their funds, but not too much. 
uh, so the employer match will be locked up more tightly and the employee contributions will uh, not be. But I think in a world where we often talk about leakage concerns and, gee, shouldn't we lock up more of the money, I agree with you, we've got to focus on the trade-off, willingness to contribute uh, versus less leakage. And I think that we're missing a sweet spot here. I also, the, also think that the, the financial wellness view takes that into account where you don't have to lock your money in just for that use and you still have the tax deduction, the protection, and, and the program to help you facilitate that. I think that has to be part of the emergency saving fund is a step toward giving you more flexibility but keeping that money for appropriate uses. And we'll Steven squeeze in one more question. Thanks. Uh, Ed Bartholomew, independent consultant. So yeah, I have a question right about um, right the appropriateness of nominal non-inflation indexed annuities as a QLAC. I mean, when you consider 3.5%, who knows what inflation is going to be over, say, a 20-year period. 3.5%, you lose half your purchasing power. 7% inflation, you, you lose 75% of your purchasing power. Is that really an appropriate vehicle for establishing kind of a base income post age 85? Uh, the QLAC should allow keeping up with inflation, right, under the QLAC rules. So I think there's a good basis for making sure that, and that's the, isn't that the concern you're raising? Well, my concern is, as you, ra as you point yeah, out, more inflation index annuities, right. aside from Social Security, right. are almost non-existent. And so as a practical matter, I think we'd expect to see nominal annuities being put in the QLAC, or maybe you think they shouldn't be, and I'm questioning whether they should be. Yeah, and I, I guess I would suggest one solution here is, apart from bigger picture things like should the government issue very, very long-term bonds to help mm -hmm. uh, stimulate the inflation indexed annuity market, and these guys have lots of deep thinking about that, pro or con, the ability to just step up the annuity, regardless of inflation, and say, we'll pay 3% more every year, or 4% more every year. Consistent with long-term inflation, like three or less being right, long-term inflation projections. That would take care of a lot of it. You wouldn't have that open-ended risk for the insurance carrier. What if a cure for cancer, God forbid, gets discovered? Uh, the, the insurance carrier would know this is, <laughs> this is a, a predictably ascending annuity. Uh, and that, um, I think that would be an easy solution. What I'm concerned about is the, the advice that one of the very experienced actuaries who was a leader of, of the academy in the past, uh, whom I won't name, uh, shared with me the other day. And I don't know whether he's right or wrong, but it comes from a credible source, that the problem with the QLAX is not a problem with the QLAX. He said, it's a problem with the industry. So the QLACs are too simple and too good a product for the consumer. The industry doesn't have enough bells and whistles in which to confuse people about price, <laughs> to impede the, the competitive free market from working well so that people can compare apples to apples annuities. The QLAC strips away most of that. And because it's so simple and because it makes so much sense for the consumer, and this is I'm just literally quoting this guy. I'm not endorsing this view. That's why the market, though it's taken up the QLAC, has not been selling a lot of QLACs with great enthusiasm. Well, this has been a great discussion, and we will continue after the break. Terrific insights. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, Mark and Ted. I'll win, we want them back. When, when, should they, when are we going to start? Should, and please uh, rejoin us at 11.05. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. If everyone could take their seats, um, we want to leave plenty of time for questions at the end because I know there was a lot of questions we did not get to. Um, so um, take your seats and we'll go ahead and get started. I've already um, introduced Steve uh, Vernon, a research scholar at the Stanford Center on Longevity, and we will turn it over to him to continue our discussion. Um, now he will cover living in retirement. Thanks, Lori, and thanks to all of you for coming out and talking about these important issues. These are important issues affecting all of Americans, and I think we in the room 
are the people who will help them retire at security. So thank you for your contribution. I want to talk a little bit about where I'm coming from so you can put my remarks into context. Is I've worked all my life um, since age 22 in retirement programs. And I worked as a consulting actuary, help employers run their retirement programs for over 35 years. I retired as a vice president from Watson Wyatt about 12 years ago. And during that time, I was in the front lines of the transition from defined benefit to defined contribution plans. Now, I understood the reasons why my clients didn't want to sponsor defined benefit plans anymore. But all along, I thought it was a bad idea to let ordinary workers, to ask them to be their own investment manager and to be their own actuary. And so I got really interested in that challenge. And um, somewhere in my mid-50s, I started looking at my own situation. I thought, you know, there's not enough money to retire in your late 50s, or early 60s, and live another 30 years, possibly. There just isn't enough money. I need to keep working. But I didn't want to keep working in the same way that I had been working. So um, I embarked on an encore career. And now I do research at the Stanford Center on Longevity, where I apply my actuar actuarial expertise and experience to solving these kinds of problems. I'm researching retirement income strategies, behavioral economics. But also, I get in front of ordinary workers. I do retirement planning workshops. And then finally, my wife and I run a boutique publishing company where we publish four books on retirement. And I mention this because in the process of writing these books, I also write columns for CBS Money Watch. I get face to face with ordinary workers making these decisions. And I correspond with readers. I read the comments on my blogs at CBS Money Watch. And it creates a virtuous cycle in that interacting with ordinary workers who are struggling with this informs the research. And then the research and strategies we look at, then I can weave back into the writing and the workshops. And so um, this is the context that I'm coming from. And finally, I'll say, as a lot of the strategies I'll be talking about, actually we're doing in our own situation. I just turned 65, and now all my work on retirement has becoming very personal. <laughs> so um, decisions become a lot more complex as workers transition from the workplace into retirement. And so the most important decisions are when to retire, when to claim Social Security, whether or not you're going to work part-time for a while. Are you going to use your savings to help optimize your Social Security benefit, as Steve Goss talked about earlier? Do you deploy your home equity? And if you do, how you do, will you do that? Arranging for health insurance, both pre-Medicare and post-Medicare. Staying healthy and reducing your living expenses. So these are all a series of very complex decisions that older workers are facing as they transition from the workplace into retirement. And so how can employers um, and policy support workers as they're making these complex decisions. By the way, I want to say I've just published a book that came out uh, this month, and it does cover all of these decisions that we're talking about. And it's my contribution of applying the actuarial skills and experience to these complex decisions. So, actually, I think I need the clicker. Um, let's see where we are here. Whoa, we're not in discussion? Living in retirement, okay. So I've seen the statistics on savings of older Americans, older workers in their 50s and 60s, and I can state with confidence that the vast majority of American workers don't have enough savings to retire full time at age 62, I'm sorry, 65, under their current standard of living, their pre-retirement standard of living. Let me repeat that, the vast majority of Americans do not have the financial resources to retire full time at age 65 under their pre-retirement standard of living. Now, some people call this a retirement crisis, and I prefer to call it a serious retirement planning challenge. Because if you analyze your financial resources and you do a good job of this, you're gonna decide, maybe I need to work longer, that was a decision I made, or maybe I need to reduce my standard of living, which was another decision that I made, or some combination. And so really, I want to look at policy changes that could help support these decisions. So the major goals that could be influenced by policy um, is to help older workers develop retirement income portfolios. And what I mean by that is that modern portfolio theory was developed in the last decades of the 20th century 
to help accumulate money. And we've been studying using those same concepts in decumulating money, and they work just fine. And so what we're seeing is that building a diverse portfolio of retirement income using modern portfolio techniques is what we're suggesting. This says that you really don't want to deploy your savings in isolation without considering what your level of Social Security benefits are, whether or not you're going to work part-time, do you have a pension, how much money do you need to spend. And so we're saying all of those should go into developing a robust retirement income portfolio. But the other thing we know is that just providing the statistics and facts and figures, that only affects the, the part of the workforce that I think Ted was talking about that are already motivated and already paying attention. And what we're knowing is that financial literacy and financial education only impacts a small part of the workforce. And so we really need to move beyond that into considering the behavioral economics principles that are in play. So we really need a holistic view. And the holistic view that I'm saying down here is working longer. That's part of the view. But also um, staying healthy. Um, remaining engaged with life, being part of your extended community. And we're also advocating that people build a social portfolio that is just as robust and diversified as their financial portfolio. So these are really what I'm meaning about holistic view. Some of these things policy can support, and some of these are more individual actions. So to help facilitate retirement income portfolios, I think the next evolution in defined contribution plan design is to offer workers and participants the ability to convert their savings into retirement income. And as we've talked about, this is a complex task that is beyond the skills of the vast majority of workers. This is the car parts thing that Ted was talking about earlier. What we're seeing is left to their own devices, older workers and retirees tend to exhibit one of two distinct strategies. The first strategy is conserving their savings for a rainy day and they're making minimal withdrawals. They're hoarding their money. And they end up usually dying with a lot of money in the bank. And actually, we're seeing statistics lately that a lot of older workers are growing their assets throughout retirement. So that's one camp. The opposite camp is people who wing it by withdrawing. They're using their savings as a checking account, and they're spending their money on whatever they normally spend money on. And most of the surveys I'm seeing shows that they're spending at an unsustainable rate, and they're going to probably run out of money in their 70s or even their 80s. So I think both camps are not optimal, and I think both camps can do better. And I think the plan sponsor is in the ideal position to offer retirement income solutions without having that bias, without having the bells and whistles that we've talked about. They are able to offer these as an employee and a retiree benefit. And so what I'd like the plan sponsor, they can use their skills and expertise to devise a retirement income menu. So my favorite idea on this is to offer a retirement income menu that sits right alongside the investment menu. And I suggest safe harbors so that the employers can adopt this retirement income menu without fear of being sued. Because as Ted mentioned earlier, this is paralyzing employers for fear of doing anything creative that they're going to be sued. And so my suggestion, and this is my best idea, is enable employers to offer a retirement income menu. And we can use the template that 404C, ERISA 404C provides for the accumulation phase. What I'm suggesting is a retirement income menu that has three distinct retirement income solutions. Retirees can freely allocate their money as they transition to retirement. That's the template from 404C. And the three that I suggest would be some kind of installment payment with invested assets. You would have some kind of an annuity. And you would have a period certain payout. I think uh, Steve Goss called that a Social Security bridge payment. Um, that would, or maybe Mark called that, whoever it is, it's a Social Security bridge payment um, that would enable the worker to use their 401k balance to fill in for Social Security while they're delaying until age 70. The annuity could either be in plan or it could be out of plan through an IRA rollover into an annuity bidding platform. And if you, do, if you haven't heard of these annuity bidding platforms, I think that's a wonderful development. It gets around this bells and whistles issue that we talked about. 
Basically, you give your money to an insurance company, I'm sorry, to a, 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 not insurance company, you give us money to this platform, they bid your annuity competitively and consistently to a number of insurance companies, and they pick the best rate for you. I published a paper in 2014 that laid out how this uh, template for 404C could apply in the retirement income phase, and these ideas are still good. It's only four years later. Um, so I believe that this could make a tremendous improvement in helping older workers convert their savings into income. The employer should have the freedom to designate one of these options as a QDRIA, Qualified Deferred Re Default Retirement Income Alternative. There are many uh, reasonable ways to do this, and I would suggest that the employer should have the freedom to be able to do this. They should have the freedom to have a different QDRA for employee money as an employer money. And I think Mark was talking about that earlier. They could say we're requiring you to put your employer money into an annuity, whereas you can, uh, the, or not requiring, we're defaulting you into that, or we'll default you your own money into an invested asset solution. Our research at Stanford demonstrates that there are many reasonable ways to deploy 401k and IRA savings in retirement. The perfect solution doesn't exist, but there are a lot of very good solutions. So we don't need to wait for another solution to be invented. Now, sure, we should continue looking to fine tune this, but we have very good solutions today that have worked quite well. And so don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. When you're building a retirement income portfolio, ideally the retiree would balance some trade-offs. There's trade-offs like maximizing expected income, uh, enough liquidity to change your mind, protection against inflation, protection against stock market crashes. These are all different goals that involve trade-offs. And so that's why I think having a menu of different choices so that the retiree can customize their retirement income portfolio to their circumstances if they want, or they're defaulted into something the employer thinks might work for a lot of folks. So just to wrap up this part is that I think to enable this, we need some kind of safe harbor uh, rules or regulations that would protect employers from lawsuits and make them feel more comfortable to do this. Now I want to talk about, um, I think I've talked about this, I want to talk about a straightforward retirement income strategy that most people can understand. And it goes like this. What are your basic living expenses? Food, utility, medical premiums. Cover those with lifetime guaranteed payments. Social Security, a pension if you have one, an annuity. Most people can understand this. Then you take your remaining assets and you invest them and draw them down. Those are the uh, expenses that are discretionary. Travel, hobbies, spoiling your grandkids. And so this is kind of a framework that I think a lot of people can understand. We analyzed this and other solutions. Last year, we published a paper. We studied 292 different retirement income solutions. We consistently compared and analyzed them. And we published a paper called How to Pensionize Any IRA or 401k. And in that, we introduced a strategy called the Spend Safely in Retirement Strategy. Now keep, again, keep in mind, I'm from academia now. I'm not pitching this to make money. We're just putting this out here to have some good ideas for discussion. So here's how this spend safely retirement strategy works. First, you optimize your social security through a thoughtful delay strategy, building on what Steve Goss and others have said. And our analyses show that most middle income workers, if they do that, they're going to receive anywhere from two-thirds to three-fourths or higher of their total retirement income portfolio from Social Security. Think about it. This is, a, again, three-fourths of your total retirement income is guaranteed for life, protected against inflation, and it won't go down if the stock market crashes. That's pretty darn good. That says the remaining one-quarter of your retirement income portfolio, you can invest that. And our strategies were suggesting use the IRS required minimum distribution, it actually works okay as a retirement payout strategy. And you couple that with a common target date fund or a balance fund, and our analyses actually showed that that strategy, optimizing Social Security, taking savings and using the RMD with either a balanced fund or a target date fund, that outperformed most of the other 292 strategies that we looked at. And so this is a very straightforward strategy, and it could be supported by the retirement income menu that I was just talking about. 
So let's talk about behavioral economics for a second. Um, classic economic theory, uh, the economists assume that everyone, when they make a decision, they analyze their situation, they know that they have a problem they need to pay attention to, they study this, they study all their options, and then they have the discipline to implement those options. And that's basically the assumption that most economists make. Basically, they're assuming that we all act like Mr. Spock of Star Trek. And so law, the psychologists in Madison Avenue have long scoffed at that rational consumer. And I think their image of the typical consumer is more like Homer Simpson than Mr. Spock. And so really, though, the vast majority of 401k plans are designed for Mr. Spock, and they're not designed for Homer Simpson. So we need to keep in mind Homer when we're developing these retirement strategies. And so what's consistent about the behavioral economics research, one thing that's consistent is that people love to do nothing. That's why defined benefit plans were so successful, because people didn't have to do anything to make them work. And so how do we make defined contribution plans work in the background where you don't have to do anything? <coughs> we have one very good example is that the, Q, the TIA system that was implemented for college professors in the last part of the 20th century worked very, very well. And it was very simple. High contributions, and most, if not all, of your balance was annuitized. We know what, that's one solution that works very well. So um, I think we need to consider how are we going to design these retirement programs where we put together the car for the employee, we don't make them put together the car by themselves. So I want to go on um, to talking about using more descriptive terms, and this is an example of the power of behavioral economics. Um, as we've heard, delaying Social Security until age 70, if possible, is a good strategy, and yet a lot of people um, delay uh, maybe a year or two. A lot of people retire uh, and delay, uh, start their benefits at 62. Most have started by 66, which is mistakenly called the full retirement age. So um, I'm going to suggest some different terms. Um, if you retire early, that's called early retirement. In our, strata, in our society, early implies success, like the saying, early bird gets the worm. But actually, early in Social Security terms is probably a bad idea for a lot of people. And so why not call early retirement age, instead call it the reduced retirement age, and age 62 is the maximally reduced retirement age with the maximally reduced benefit. Actually, that's more accurate. Full retirement age is not really the full retirement age because you get a higher benefit if you delay beyond 66. So we should call that the unreduced retirement age. It's a more neutral term. And finally, if you delay your benefit, we should call that the increased retirement benefit. And age 70 is called the maximum retirement age. Now I've got descriptive terms that more align with uh, what might influence people to make different decisions. And so what I'd dearly love to see is applying behavioral economics to the, accum to the decumulation period. And really what we want to do is to have more research. These are just ideas of applying the research that's been studied using the accumulation phase, and we're, we're just putting ideas out there for the decumulation phase. And I'd like to see some funding of more research on that. So I like to say to employers that part of your retirement program is not just your 401k plan, and I think you actually ought to think of alternative careers for your older workers as part of your overall retirement program. And so how do we encourage longer work lives? Well, one possibility is to consider Social Security taxes as paid up after either 35 or 40 years, both for the employer and the employee. And so that could be one way to send a message that it's okay to hire older workers. Another one I like is to have Medicare actually be the second day or a payor for active employees. Right now, if you're an active employee working after age 65, uh, Medicare, um, let's see, Medicare is primary. Yeah, uh, I was getting that backwards. Uh, Medicare is primary. Um, it should be the secondary payor. So, um, did I get that backwards? Yeah, I got that backwards. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, we should make Medicare primary. I got this backwards, excuse me. You want it to be primary for early retirement. For yeah, early yeah. Um, and not for late. For late retirement. So and Medicare is the primary payer. The employer is the secondary payer. So excuse me, I got this backwards. And this way you help even the playing field because a lot of employers think that 
older workers cost more for health insurance, and now we can help even the playing field. So these are some ideas that are fairly, um, I think, uh, particularly the retirement income menu, using more descriptive terms for Social Security. These are fairly nonpartisan ideas. Um, now let's go on to a little bit more colorful ideas. And so to help fund Medicare, why don't we have a dedicated tax on cigarettes and unhealthy foods, such as soda and sugar? Um, we all know about the obesity problem in America, so why not discourage, at the same time, discourage the consumption of those foods and also take the money and help shore up Medicare? Uh, and why is the government subsidizing the production of unhealthy foods, such as sugar and other foods? So um, these are just some more colorful ideas. I know, I acknowledge that these are, are out there, um, and they're going to generate some controversy. So why not start the debate? So I want to wrap up. Um, there are many issues that I haven't mentioned. I'm just going to run through them quickly. Uh, we talked earlier about facilitating using home equity. Last year, uh, the, how the HUD increased premiums to the FHA on reverse mortgages, which made them less attractive. I think we ought to revisit that. Um, some states, through their policies on property taxes, discourage older people from downsizing. In the state of California where I live, that's really a problem. So if you've lived in your home for a long time, there, there's a real financial disincentive to sell that home and downsize to a smaller home. I wish we could resolve this fiduciary rule versus the best interest the SEC proposal on best interest. We need to get those resolved. And it's one reason why I encourage most workers to keep their money in their 401k plan at work, because there, the people operating that plan uh, are required to be fiduciaries. And finally, uh, I'll get on my soapbox a little bit about state and local defined benefit plans. In my opinion, we're one stock market crash away for more Detroits. And it's not a matter of if we're going to have a stock market crash. It's a matter of when. When you think about it, um, from the period 1987 to 2017, we had four stock market crashes. How many do you think we're going to have in the next 10 to 20 years? And so that's a problem, I think, that's lurking out there. And there's really a straightforward yet very painful solution is to apply ERISA to the government sector. So I think we ought to start the debate on that. So I want to wrap up and say that I encourage employers to do something to help their older workers address these challenges. There are plenty of good solutions. And likewise, there are policies that the government can adopt, and some of them are nonpartisan. So to the politicians who are listening to this, I think the American public is crying out for setting aside these partisan squabbles and work together on these important issues. And I think the idea on retirement income menus, that shouldn't be a partisan issue. So here's some low-hanging fruit where the politicians can demonstrate that they can work together on something and help Americans retire. And then that might create a constructive atmosphere of compromise and working together to start tackling some of the thornier challenges. So my message to the politicians is we've got some great ideas. Let's get started. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. That There were a lot of uh, great ideas, and we'll take some questions in a minute. I'm going to uh, move through my moving forward slides very fast so that we have a lot of time for questions. Uh, really, I'm, I'm just here to summarize our discussion, and then we're going to have a quick lightning round um, asking the, the other panelists to uh, give some of their best uh, uh, final thoughts. Uh, so first off, what we heard today was um, you know, policies, uh, the need for policies and processes and uh, solutions that enable, encourage, embolden, entice um, not only uh, the employees and providers, I mean, I'm encouraged to see employers are still in the equation. We heard some solutions that uh, uh, don't necessarily include employers, but still employers are a very important part of the equation as well. Uh, there clearly is no shortage of ideas. We'll see in a moment. I have a slide that shows just a laundry list. Um, what we need to do is focus on the, uh, what we know best and will be practical and effective. We can't do everything. So where do we focus? Um, and uh, you know, I, just kind of summarizing some of the major themes in terms of uh, the broad areas to focus. You know, Steve Goss talked about restoring uh, public confidence in the sustainability of Social Security and Medicare so that people will feel 
um, that they can take uh, Social Security later. I mean, that's, that's clearly what's going on for many people is they want to get the benefit now while it's still around. Um, so how do we restore confidence? Uh, Steve Vernon talked about providing incentives to work longer for those who can. I like the concept very much of a social portfolio. Keeping in mind it's more than financial. Uh, retirement involves uh, uh, keeping people active and engaged and involved in society as well in an ideal world. Mark talked about providing protections and incentives to employers, providers, and individuals. I loved bifurcation as well. A very uh, interesting concept and uh, many others that are, are worth considering. And uh, Ted talked about uh, facilitating risk mitigation, uh, the retiree map. Very interesting concept and one that uh, definitely needs further exploration. So now to our lightning round. Uh, here's all of the concepts that we heard today. And the idea is for our panelists to pick the two or three that they think is the, um, kind of the lowest hanging fruit with the most impact. Um, and, and I'm asking our panelists to keep their responses short so that we can get to your questions. Um, so Mark, we'll start with you. Oh, uh, Laurie, I'll uh, keep it short. I think that the automatic IRAs <coughs> are the biggest thing going in a constructive direction and that uh, there is uh, uh, a need to uh, support and promote those whether at the state or the federal level, ideally, uh, ultimately, the states can, again, coordinate as they're already doing, combine, and uh, as ultimately establish a, a kind of standardized, relatively uniform national program. Josh Gottbaum is here. He's heading up the Maryland program. That's part of what gives me hope for this whole thing. Uh, and there are, there are other very talented and, and creative people involved. I think it's a shame that we have millions of dollars being spent in lobbying fees to discourage these programs, to oppose these programs, when uh, the, the folks financing that could, uh, in fact, benefit in the long term from uh, promoting uh, this kind of saving and ultimate retirement security. Um, I guess one, one comment before I say that that I think is an important observation as somebody who's also spent a lot of time on, on the, the helping employers design plans. We used to spend a lot of time uh, in the transition from DB to DC of redesigning the plan and looking at what we used to call winners and losers or grandfathering certain groups of employees. And as time moved forward, that part of the discussion dropped completely. And I've been part of organizations that I've seen organizations that have adopted the move from DB to DC just by flipping a switch, and people adapt. And I, my point is that I think we're often afraid of change, and we can withstand a lot more change than we give people credit for. So I think I would encourage as we get into these ideas, some of these things we just need to do, and people will adapt, whether it's addressing Social Security's uh, shortfall through higher taxes or lower benefits, but people are, are very uh, innovative and, and adapt. So we've got to got to take action here. If, if, you know, I'll try to be uh, not nonpartisan on my choices here, but I, I've been thinking a long time about how do we make DC plans more like DB plans and, and make them more effective mm -hmm. and more efficient and using the behavioral economic aspect of it. So I, I would really like to see us explore moving that forward uh, into the, you know, how do we help people go through this without having to spend a lot of their own personal capital to, to get to a good solution. And I also like the idea of looking at this more broadly. I don't think you can isolate retirement without taking into account the full spectrum of financial wellness. And, and I think there's a, a trend of employer trend to look more at financial wellness now, and I'd like to see that continue. Absolutely. Um, we're definitely seeing that as well. Steve? Well, I'll be real clear. We, I, I think we need a, a clear and unified voice on three problems, uh, three challenges. One is puts the Social Security on a sustainable path financially. And the last time we had funding challenges with Social Security in the 1980s, um, we had different houses, uh, different parties come together and compromise on some benefit adjustments and some revenue enhancements. And so Steve talked about they have 130 provisions they've priced out. The ideas are here. So let's compromise and put Social Security on a sustainable path. I think it's a disgrace that two-thirds or three-quarters of Americans don't think, when they're polled, they don't think Social Security will be there for them 
I think that's a disgrace. And so anybody, any politicians who's listening, let's compromise and put Social Security on a clear path, sustainable path. So that's number one. Number two, broaden the coverage issue. So we heard ideas of auto IRAs, multiple employer plans. We need to cover that other half of the workforce that currently isn't participating in the plan. And we've got good ideas there. So that's my second um, issue. And the third one is my favorite idea, the retirement income menu. How do you help people convert their savings into income and give employers the confidence that they aren't going to be sued? I'm not the only one suggesting this. Uh, earlier this week, the Bipartisan Policy Center kicked off a initiative called Funding Our Future, and these are three uh, initiatives that they're behind as well. So I think together, if we have a clear, unified voice on these issues, we can make it happen. And finally, before we go to questions, um, there are a lot of uh, bills out there currently um, proposing different solutions for retirement. What, um, which ones are um, on track and in line with some of the thinking we've heard today? Um, Steve, we'll start with you. Well, um, there's uh, the um, proposal out there, RISA, and forgive me if I'm not going to remember all the parts of retirement it. Retirement Enhancement and Savings Act. Thank you. Yeah. I knew there was retirement and there was an act. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, so they're helping to address the coverage issues, and they will also help um, support putting annuities in plans, but I'd like to see support also for the other types of retirement income solutions, like using invested assets and systematic withdrawals or Social Security bridge payments. So they're, they're, I, you know, it's okay, but they're missing something. Yeah, I, I think we've got to stop nibbling around the edges, and uh, I mean, I'll take progress as good progress, but we need to, to take a bigger step forward. Yeah, I mean, holistic has been a word we've heard a lot today, and yeah. it, it sounds like we're not necessarily seeing that with some of these bills. Mark? Yeah, I think the, uh, the RESA uh, proposal, which seems, in my view, likely to be enacted within the next year, year and a half, uh, has, has a lot of good in it. Uh, and certainly uh, having some kind of fiduciary safe harbor for uh, selection of annuities in defined contribution plans um, is, is long overdue. Uh, I think it would uh, be useful, though, for those of us who are policy types to pay closer attention to the specifics. There is a tremendous imbalance among the stakeholders in our system in terms of influence, especially on Capitol Hill. And while lots of people have the best of intentions, our intentions are not all aligned. And so there are ideas that sound good that are being implemented in a way that would not, in fact, be uh, good policy or that would be counterproductive I think there's, it, it is very helpful, therefore, and I encourage people in this room, people uh, who are watching, uh, to speak out when you see proposals that are under the banner of something that sounds like apple pie, uh, but in fact uh, is uh, a poor way of proceeding or actually is serving other interests uh, rather than the interests it's purporting to serve. Great. Um, now let's take some questions. Again, if you're online, uh, please write them down and we'll take them. But if you're in the room, uh, please state who you are and we'll take your questions as well. Let me start. Uh, Steve, do we have one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Sorry. The light's right in my eyes. <laughs> Josh Gottbaum, Brookings. Thanks, Mark, for the shout out. Uh, you, all three of you have mentioned the tension between asking more of employers and their reluctance to be fiduciaries and their reluctance to be subject to litigation, et cetera. My question is, as you say we want a safe harbor, et cetera, who takes on the consumer protection mantle for if we take it off employers? How can we do that? Uh, 
Uh, Josh, I think that's uh, a fundamental key question and that we need to separate the employers that want to continue to be robust players in the system, of whom, as we know, there are many, from the employers who essentially want to minimize their role. And that in minimizing the role for that group of employers, I don't think we should mandate that they stay in, but we should replace the kind of consumer protections that the ERISA employer-based system provides with new consumer protections to apply when the system is being run or plans are being run by private sector consulting firms or financial providers. And that you know, the economies of scale and the concentration of expertise that we can gain from not having widget makers having to also serve as plan administrators where they're unwilling to do so uh, need to be controlled by regulation. You know, we need more sensible, light-handed, careful, selective uh, rules. Because if we don't have the employer-based rules in place, we are going to lose uh, much of what we're striving for. And to put a finer point on it, we talk about the sort of common goals and objectives. We talk about what works and what doesn't work. I think we need to keep digging deeper into what we mean by works and what we're striving to achieve. There's a lot of superficial emphasis on how many assets are being collected uh, in the interest of uh, making profits, often fair profits, on investment management. But there is very little emphasis on who's getting what benefits and how much, whether we're serving the people who need the help the most, uh, and the constant industry focus on accumulation of assets, a AUM, assets under management, has created in Congress as well a kind of AU emphasis, if you will, <laughs> that I think is undermining good policy. Instead of just collecting more dollars, which are lucrative and which are, it's legitimate to do and are certainly great for our macro economy. That's part of our whole purpose of the private pension system. We ought to focus more on whether the taxpayer, as the equity investor in this largest transaction in the world, a $200 billion a year, somewhat overestimated, but call it even half of that, uh, investment in the private pension system through tax favor treatment, whether the taxpayer is getting a good return on their investment, is getting good bang for their buck. And that means those consumer protections. That means looking at fees and expenses, not just conflicts of interest, but going to the fees and expenses themselves and um, looking at whether people are getting the taxpayers and the people they're trying to protect by having this tax favored system are getting the incremental retirement security, usually in the form of income, that they need. Well, and one real life example that we've talked about is the RISA lifetime income safe harbor of, you know, has that gone too far in one direction? <clears throat> Should it be tied to, you know, selecting firms that have certain ratings and so forth? And the Academy has written a comment letter that we're going to submit that gives some ideas. But I think, Josh, your point is well taken. We can't go too far. You can't swing the pendulum too far in one direction and end up with, with a lot of bad practices. If I could just add, I think you said who's going to protect the consumer. Well, the, the writing, the rules of the Department of Labor and the IRS, those are intended to protect consumers. We need to uh, properly fund those, those institutions so that they can uphold their duty there. I think right now we've given too much power to the attorneys bringing class action suits. And that's what's paralyzed the, um, the employers. And we just need to swing that pendulum back away a little bit. Steve, did you have a, a comment? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, I guess. This is, uh, yeah a, a question. You've all sort of referred to sort of the two aspects of being ready for retirement. One is to accumulate something that you'll have when you retire, and the other is how you're going to distribute it across your remaining lifetime. I, I would suggest you've emphasized probably a lot more the former than the latter, although everybody's spoken to annuities and the issues with annuities. 
we've all been challenged with how do we get people to better think in terms of annuitizing or at least reasonably spreading their money over time. I would suggest that part of the problem has been we've done a bang up job on showing people their 401k and IRA statements, this nice big hunk of money that they have accumulated over time, uh, and that's wonderful. Now, I, let me just offer as a model, if you go to your socialsecurity.gov and look at your social security statement, it doesn't talk about the lifetime accumulation amount of money you might have. It shows you what your retirement monthly income might be based on what you've earned so far. So why don't we request, require, or in some way, anybody who has a retirement savings account in whatever form, that it not just show the lump sum, in fact, maybe even show that secondary, but show what you have accumulated to date, how much this would be worth, perhaps relative to your current earnings level, and if we have somebody who's 30 and we say this is gonna be worth X dollars per year, then do you, you know, do you index it up to a higher nominal level in the future, which will misrepresent it, put it in today's dollars? You could say relative to sort of like what your current earnings mm -hmm. level is, how much that will be worth on a monthly basis. If you leave it in there, and you could do this especially at a point when people are changing jobs, so as, so as to give them a little impetus to maybe leave it in there as opposed to say, I want to buy a Lexus instead of a Honda. Right. So, Steve, this right. is almost the 10th anniversary of the day that I sat down with Phyllis Borzi and suggested yeah. that, mm -hmm. which was several years after others in this room, and including yourself, had proposed this, generally giving the statement of retirement income equivalency, protecting employers from being sued, from any liability for projecting, giving them some norms or corridors within which to do that, but doing it in a way that does not limit the private sector creativity in stating, in providing different ways to approach people. And, you know, I think that what we've had, in fact, is too prescriptive an effort to, to force disclosures into certain patterns we've had of the income equivalent of the account balance. And uh, we've had a, uh, it, this goes to many of the things we're talking about. You know, it's easy we should be, continue to espouse the good ideas, but we should also pay attention to the implementation challenges. And you know, while the Labor Department tried to do this for years uh, and didn't do it successfully, there's a very legitimate industry split which is holding this up. It's in RISA. It's one of the provisions in RISA that is actually conceivably um, at risk of, right. you know, it looks like it's going to con probably continue in the bill, but it's one of the handful of provisions, like one of the other ones that someone suggested here, a uh, perfectly good idea, control the, uh, 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 the IRA stretch, the stretch IRA. You can defer to your great-grandkids, uh, lots of the required minimum distributions. Well, that's already been pretty much uh, neutered out of RISA and is about to be potentially completely removed. Uh, this too, it's the subject, and you know, the Jason, you could talk to us very persuasively about what the mutual fund industry feels. Others could talk very persuasively about what the insurance industry feels about this. We haven't been able to really reach a good compromise on that, and that's why that hasn't happened, both at the administrative and the legislative level. I'd like to think that we can, because I think there are very reasonable points in both industries, uh, and that there should be a way to get consensus on this and get it done. The way it's being done, I'll just add, is in the private sector. In the meanwhile, as the regulators have failed to get it done and as Congress is struggling to, to do it, so many calculators, so many websites, have terrific uh, income projections where you can save on impulse by looking at how much your retirement income will be increased if you just add another point of contribution or invest in a more diversified way. And, and there's, been, there's been a survey showing that, at least for large employers, um, the, major, the vast majority of them do work with record keepers that already provide exactly um, the income Right. equivalent in retirement on the Don't statements. want to discourage that. Don't want to discourage that with regulations yeah. or statutory provisions that inadvertently curtail 
you know, the creativity that the private sector has already shown being more than a decade ahead of government on this. I want to jump in on this idea because I, first of all, when we were planning this, we, Ted and I were, us were saying we're probably going to miss an idea we should have talked about. Thank you, Steve Goss. We didn't talk about retirement income statements. Um, part of the, it's a great idea and the devil's in the details. And the two things that hold up this is what's the product you assume? Are you assuming you're going to buy an annuity? Or what's the interest rate you're going to assume? And so let me point out uh, that there are two ways to address this. One is the retirement income menu, which I like. You could say, here's what your income would be if you bought an annuity. Here's what it would be if you invested it and drew it down. Here's what it would be in the Social Security bridge payment. Those are tremendously different amounts, and the employee could help make a decision as to which one works for them. So that's one way to address this issue of which are you going to show, because the controversy is showing one income amount out there when there's actually a lot of different income amounts. And then the other idea is that the, the strategy I was talking about earlier, the spend safely in retirement strategy, you don't need to make interest rate assumptions or product assumptions. We know what the Social Security benefits rules are if you delay it. That's not controversial. And we know what the RMD rules are. And so you don't need to make assumptions about a product or interest rates, and that can form a baseline that says, here's a very straightforward strategy that anybody can do. Here's what the amount is. If you can do better, find that way, but here's the baseline. So I'm giving you two different ways to address the practical challenges in preparing those retirement income statements. We do have um, some questions from online. One, uh, kind of Steve gets at the, you, you talked about two drawdown strategies, the conserving strategy and the wing it. Maybe this falls into the wing it category. Um, you know, following up on the financial wellness theme, Steve Alpert asks, um, fundamentally saving means consuming less than you are earning. Are there suggestions to reduce debt-fueled consumption, including education, uh, which can delay saving for retirement and make uh, less available when the time comes? And indeed, we are finding that more and more people are entering retirement with significant levels of debt. So. Uh let me say that is a problem. In fact, we're at the Stanford Center of Longevity. We're about ready to release a report that is comparing assets and debt levels of current baby boomers entering into retirement compared to prior generations of workers. And it's not a pretty picture. They're entering retirement with less assets and more debt of all kinds. And so that's clearly an issue. Now, what can policy do about that? I mean, I think I'm going to sound like my grandparents. You know, the advent of credit cards are evil. You know. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're a consumer-oriented society. Uh, we're reaping the challenges that that's all generated. And I don't have any policy ideas other than to help uh, on that. Um, Mark's raising his eyebrows. Maybe he does, but... Well, others do. Yeah, so... Yeah. So, um, switching gears, and uh, talking about... Uh, this is from Chuck Freelander online. Um, you have presented many great ideas. What chance do you give Congress of passing any of them in the current uh, <laughs> political climate? Um, are you anticipating the impact of a Democratic takeover of Congress? And maybe more practically speaking, um, Mark, you got automatic enrollment done <laughs> without uh, the need for Congress to be involved. Maybe you can speak to that. How did you get it done? And is that a, a solution here? Got it done very carefully. <laughs> uh, it was in uh, some scars. <laughs> many scars for that and many other things. It, it's the 20th anniversary of that, almost to the week oh. now. And the, the concern with auto enrollment, you know, the opt out approach to 401k plans, that I had originally, as we first, when I was in Treasury, started to consider sh should it be, is it legal, should we make it permissible, uh, was one, the concern that. Uh, ideologically, it would be attacked as too paternalistic and would become a partisan issue. Second, that it might crowd out employer matching contributions, which I thought would be sort of tragic if it did. Employers get a non-discrimination benefit when they get auto enrollment, pushing the non-contributors into contributing, nudging them into that. They also get a non-discrimination benefit from using a match to induce people to contribute. And we wouldn't want employers to drop the match because of auto-enrollment. Uh, and thirdly, I was concerned that we would have, frankly, employer stock as the default investment if auto-enrollment was used and there was one, there was some reason to fear 
that at the time. So what we did, Lori, was to use not a regulation, which would have been the normal go-to art form for regulating this, but a ruling, which meant you could tell a story, a fact, factual narrative, and try to nudge people in a certain direction without saying that they couldn't go elsewhere. We nudged them into auto-enrolling. We gave the example of 3%. Far from adequate, but given the concern, at least that I had at the time, that it could become a political football, wanted to introduce it gently and in a way that would have the best chance of getting the bipartisan buy-in that it has, in fact, gotten. So you use behavioral so, science to get behavioral uh, science implemented. Uh, uh, exactly. <laughs> Very much so. And, and also, we illustrated the permissible auto-enrollment with an employer match, the same match the company had before it implemented auto. And we used a QDIA, which this is 1998, so we didn't use that term. But I tried to get labor to announce that the default investment could be a diversified, balanced fund. They weren't ready to bless that back then. They were years later. So we just put it into our ruling with a balanced fund, diversified equities, and fixed income, and got Labor to give us a footnote saying that they'd read it. Uh, <laughs> and that they, you know, that it was subject to risk on the normal prudence rules. They, they weren't willing to put a thumb on the scale as they later did with QDIAs. And that ended up getting about 30% of the large 401k market to use auto enrollment after seven or eight years before the congressional legislation took that almost one third and bumped it up to the two thirds that we're seeing today. And I'm being told that uh, we're out of time, unfortunately. Uh, this has been an incredibly um, productive discussion, though clearly, though, just the beginning. And we will need to do a lot more to kind of continue this discussion and build out these ideas. So thank you very much. And, and please thank the panel with me. Well, thank you all for being here, both uh, in person and online. Uh, I've been asked to say a quick announcement. I am the most, uh, this is not the announcement, this is a preface to the announcement. <laughs> I'm the most technologically backwards person you'll probably meet at my age kind of cohort. But I'm told that we like to continue this discussion on something called Twitter. <laughs> and you may use something called a hashtag, uh, which is, oh, it's, one of the, it's on the slides, even better. Where is it? Modernizing retirement. So before we wrap up, I want to also have one more word of thanks. Uh, for those of you who don't know how the academy works, we have volunteers and we have staff. And the general kind of approach is volunteers think of things, staff does things. So academy staff put an enormous amount of work into this event. So I want to thank them all very much for doing so and offer them a round of applause as well. <laughs> we hope this is the first of many events like this and we hope they always get better. So if you have suggestions or ideas for how to improve, please share them. And otherwise, thank you all very much. <laughs>